for her, and I made a co an extra another copy for me. So we're going to say this. If you have your Bible or your electronic device, uh, let's uh, let's say this this confession. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today I will be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same. I am about to receive the incorruptible, indestructible, ever living seed of the Word of God. I will never be the same. Never, never, never. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, all right. Let's give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Yeah. I want to talk about being led by the Spirit, being led by God today. And I, I really wanted to talk about the prophetic, but I, but I thought, how can I talk about the prophetic when we have to get the basics down of really learning how to hear from the Spirit of God and, uh, and, and these type of things. So, so th there's a dimension of Christianity that's not... Uh, well promoted and because because a lot of pastors including myself are afraid people are going to get weird and flaky but I have I know that you people are well grounded in the Bible and so that you're you, you know we, we've trained you well the Word of God is taught here very rich and very deep so I'm not I'm not insecure about those kind of things and uh, and trust me there is good accountability so if somebody gets off on weirdness we will lovingly try to um, uh, you know, cast the demons out of you. No. So, that's a joke. Uh, but maybe, you know, it could happen. So, <laughs> so it should always be understood that the foundation of what we're talking about here is that the Word of God is always something that we measure every experience by. The Word of God is something that we measure the experience by. So, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Romans chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. Romans chapter 8, being led by God, Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, or according to our sinful desires, that's what the flesh is. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put the death, the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So there's being led by the Spirit of God right there. And it's, and it's about being led into righteousness. When your conscience is awakened, when you're a born-again believer, your conscience is awakened, and all of a sudden you're like, ooh, I can't do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. Oh, this, that grosses me out. I don't want any part of that anymore. I reject that in Jesus' name. Right? And, and you start desiring the hungry for the word. I, I like to get with people of like faith that are going to encourage me. I, I want to get, I want to get lean, learn the Bible. You know, I, I love the worship service. I love worshiping the Lord. There's new desires and new things that are awakened. Your conscience is awakened. And you're led by the Spirit of God. So if you're led by the Spirit of God in your conscience, can he lead you in your walk, in your, in your life? Can the Spirit of God lead you? Yeah, he can. He most of the decisions in life do have a moral attachment to a, a moral uh, right and wrong about them. So the Holy Spirit can help you make be, deal wisely with the affairs of life. You can be led by the Spirit of God. Okay, um, now in Christianity, uh, it's the only religion on the face of the planet where you actually have a personal God and you can know God personally. Every other God or every other religion, their God is impersonal and unknowable. But in Christianity, you can have an actual friendship and relationship with the living God. <laughs> Somebody say, yeah, amen. Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. I mean, to think that we can have fellowship, we can have friendship with the God who spoke the universe into existence. All power, all wisdom, all might, that is him. All love. Yeah, and he loves you. He's crazy about you. The reason, the reason why, you know, people say, well, if you love yourself and you can love other people, you know. 
Because because Jesus, Jesus said, if you can't love yourself, the only reason I can love myself and accept myself is because I am so loved by God. You know, and, and I can't hate myself because the love of God just keeps pouring out on me. I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I have value because God values me. God values you. God loves you. He gave his life for you. And because he values you so much, who are we not to love ourselves and accept ourselves and like ourselves? Because God loves us. Yeah. Okay, happy birthday, Joe. <laughs> I was looking at his big smiling face back then. I went, Joe, happy birthday. Hope you have a really good time today and every day. So as we keep going, it says, verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. How many know fear gets you in bondage? How many know if you're, if you're deathly afraid of COVID, you're going to be weird? You're going to be weird. Right? And it's bondage. Yeah? How many know even if you, you know, wear the mask and take the vaccine, that fear is a magnet towards sickness and disease? You can do all the things that you're supposed to do and still be in such fear. Right? We reject that. This is a no fear zone in the name of Jesus. Because God... We did not receive a bondage again to fear, but received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So our spirits are crying out to God. We have personal relationship. For the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together. So the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits. What's a witness? It's kind of a knowing. And I, Joan Hunt, Hunter calls it an inkling. I don't really like that phrase, but that's what she uses. Inkling. It's a knowing. It's a witness. Yes. Yes. Uh, so you hear from God. Yes. You don't even realize that you're hearing from God sometimes. He's, he sometimes pops a witness into your spirit about something. You're like, yeah, I think, I think yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's God. Yeah. Oh, no, that's a witness of, no, I don't think that that's of God. Right? right? right. And... You're, you're not going to know whether you should take a job or not by the Bible. The Bible says that we should work with our hands that which is good. And if we're able and capable of, of working, physical work, we should, we should be doing that. And support the weak, support to help people. The Bible says to let him who stole steal no longer, but work with his hand that which is good. So that means the Bible presupposes that there's always some kind of work or job. For those who are, who are healthy enough and able to get a job. We can't say there's no jobs available. That, that frustrates the Bible. The Bible says if a man will not work, and uh, let's put able-bodied person in there, he, will, he should not eat. So why would God condemn you and say, and say you shouldn't even be able to eat if you don't work, if there wasn't work available? You know what? There's even barter system. You know, I'll chop your wood, give me a meal. <laughs> There's always something to do. <laughs> we got stuff to do, don't we, Nicole? <laughs> she's, that's why she's looking. <laughs> yeah, okay. So there's always a barter system. So, but the Spirit of God, you're, you're like, well, I need to know where to work. I need, to, I need God to help me. He can, he can help you. He can lead us. He can bear witness. There are some jobs you shouldn't take. And, and uh, not just because they don't pay enough, but some jobs might pay so much and you go, oh yeah, and, you're, and your little, you know, cha-ching goes off in your eyeballs. And then you, you take it, even though you don't have a, a total peace in your spirit, you take the job and it's so stressful. They're demanding 80 hours a week out of you. They're calling you night and day. It's so stressful. You don't have any time with your family. But hey, you know, you're getting the big bucks now. Some jobs... You have to know that this is not of God. Just because it pays a lot doesn't mean it's of God. So how do we know this? The Spirit can bear witness. We can have close, by you having close relationship to Jesus, you get a witness, a knowing in your spirit, a peace of God that leads you and guides you and helps you with the affairs of life. Now, I have ignored the Spirit of God at times, and I'll tell you, there's a cost. There's... <laughs> 
thank God, you know, that some of the cost wasn't so bad. <laughs> but it was still enough where it went, don't do that again. Yeah? I remember one time I bought this truck. It was a uh, four-wheel drive Ford what was it? It was, it was a Ford Bronco, yeah. It was a Ford Bronco, and it was it looked really cool. And I didn't ask my wife. And you just I just want you to know when you're making big decisions and you're making them together, you should probably run it by each other. You know, and make sure that you're both in agreement. All you people that are going to get married, make sure that <laughs> the big financial decisions that you're in unity about before you do them. You know, and uh, I I didn't ask my wife about it, which. Which, the reason I ask her is because I use her as a check and a balance. She, she, we hear from God together. If, if she has an absolute negative piece totally about it, then I consider that. I really consider that. Because sometimes we hear God differently, you know. And we're a good check and balance to each other. So anyways, to make a short story longer, I bought this truck. And it was a lemon. It was a huge lemon. It was a, it was a money-sucking machine. And I had to finally get rid of that thing. And I just went, okay, from now on, if I'm going to buy a big money item, I'll run it by my wife. And we'll pray about it together and make sure that we're in unity. Amen? Amen? So, so you can ignore that witness and pay. <laughs> not just financially, there's other ways you pay too that are not good. Okay, so as we, as, uh, we keep going, let's look, go to Acts chapter 16. Look at this scripture here, Acts chapter 16. This leads nicely into my, what we were just talking about. Acts chapter 16. Now look at, uh, starting with verse 6. Now when they had gone through the Pergia and the region of Galatia, they, they, notice the word they, you should underline that word, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they, underline the word they, after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So I passed by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision immediately, we sought the Lord to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel there. This is interesting because God's leading a group, a group of people. Can God lead a church together? Yeah, and can, can things bear witness with the church together? I mean, it bore witness with us that we need a new parking lot. It bore witness with us that we needed to, to knock out this wall and ex expand the church building. And in every big decision, it should bear witness with. And there's always, you know, in a church setting, there's always like one lone voice that's like, oh, thus says the Lord, no, don't do it. So that if you fail, they can, they can claim to be the lone prophetic voice that told you not to do it. So there's, there's always a naysayer that's just always negative. You know, I'm not talking about those type of people. I'm talking generally, the, you know, and I'm not looking at anybody here. There's nobody here like that. But, but I'm just saying generally, <laughs> generally you want unity. You want the church to move together in unity. And it bears witness with the, with the whole church. Most every, most every decision that we make as a board, we make sure that we're all in agreement about it. And we're all in unity about it. Because we use each other to bear witness with the Spirit. Right? Because we see through a glass darkly. We don't always hear from God perfectly. But when you have a spiritual group of people that hear from, that, that you can hear from God better, you know, B better together. Yeah. So, we, you can see the Holy Spirit forbade them to go and preach the word in Asia. Did the Holy Spirit not like the people in Asia? No, it was a timing thing. God, God wanted the, the best fruitfulness, you know. It, it, it was a timing thing. And how did the Holy Spirit forbid them? I mean, we, we don't, it doesn't really say that the whole, don't go into Asia. <laughs> no, they, they were trying to go into Asia. And it was like, oh, I don't know about you, but I, I don't feel like this is the direction of God. What about you guys? What do you guys think? And they prayed some more about it. And they went, oh, we're, we're not supposed to go there. Yeah. Yeah. Witness. Knowing. In their hearts, in their spirits. Lack of peace. Okay? And it said they came to Mysia and tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of God did not permit them. 
Here's another thing too. Sometimes God cannot steer a parked car. So, so if you're like, I, I refuse to do anything until God tells me. Well, sometimes you just got to try something. And, and as you're going forward, the Lord says, nope, not that way. Then try that door. Nope, not that way. Try that door. Nope, not that way. He can tell you if it's not the right direction, can he? Yeah? Okay. So, so passing by Mysia, they came to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Now, here's, here's something. You know, we are a very prophetic people. Sometimes God speaks in visual pictures. In this one, when it says vision in the night, dream. Some kind of dream. God can, can speak to us in dreams. Um, he spoke to me several times in a dream. As a matter of fact, I have a book called Spirit World that's on that shelf. And that, in that book, I talk about a whole, I dedicate two chapters to dreams and visions. But, but uh, one dream I had before I was saved, I was at the great white throne judgment. And I explained what I saw in the dream of the great white throne judgment. And how God used that dream to get me saved. To, 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 to help me come to Jesus. And in the dream, I actually saw the, the book of life and some of the books that were opened. And I didn't even know there was a book of life. It wasn't until later when I became a Christian and somebody told me about the book of life and showed me in the Bible. I went, whoa, I saw those books in that dream. I didn't even know there was books of life or angels looking at these things. <laughs> so God, God can speak in dreams. Now, you know, not every dream is God speaking to you. You, that's where the discernment and the witness of the Holy Spirit. But there are dreams where that, that you go, you know, I think God's trying to get something to me with that dream. I need to seek God about its interpretation. Right? Now, one of the languages of the Holy Spirit is visual pictures. Most language, language is just symbols of, 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 of other things. If I say horse... You think of a horse. If I say a brown horse, you think of a brown horse. Right? The language was, was a symbol. It communicated a visual image. So one of the ways that God speaks to us is with visual images. Okay, come on. Yeah? And we do this thing uh, where we pray for people. Uh, and and we, we haven't done it. We're going to have to do it again, you know, at uh, our Thursday night prayer meeting. We, we call it the hot seat. We, and we ask somebody to sit there so we can pray with them. And then I, as we're praying with them, I ask, now, if you're getting a visual picture or a scripture, let's, let's, this is a safe place, let's share those visual pictures. If you're, getting, if you're praying for them, you get a visual picture of something. And they're always, in, well, 99% of the time they're very encouraging. There is the 1% time where it's a divine warning. Which uh, you're like, ooh, I don't want to sit in the hot seat. No, it's good for you. And uh, uh, we didn't even expect it one time. I don't want to even tell you the story. Should I tell them the story? It's so bad. Yeah. So, so I, <laughs> I... I'll tell you two stories, because you guys like the dirt. And uh, so, so this is so good. So we're praying for this woman, and, you know, I'm the pastor, so, I'm online. Hi, everybody. So we're praying for this woman, which none of you know this person. No one knows this person. No names are given. But as a pastor, you know, I know I do, I, I'm not going to give her any words. I'm not going to give her any visual pictures because it'll look like I'm, because I know everything. Because I'm the pastor, you know. So I let the body minister to them, not knowing anything. And so, and so the, the one lady says to her, why am I getting a picture of the light of heaven shining down on you? And then you're folding your arms and turning your back on the light. Why am I getting a picture of that? And she was, she was stubbornly resisting what God wanted her to do. And she, and she was like, I don't know. I don't know why you could possibly be. But as the pastor, I'm like, <laughs> can't say anything about it. There was one time I was... I was I was having this, this, doing this little exercise, and this guy volunteered to come up and be prayed for. And I had another guy pray for him and say, are you getting any visual picture? He goes, why am I seeing a snake wrapped around 
around you in a snake, you know, in bondage. And I'm like, oh my gosh. I didn't realize it, but this, this guy was heavily into some weird, nasty things that I don't even want, that's not even mentionable. And, uh, and, we, we, uh, and we had to pray for him right there. So those are, the, those are bad things. Normally, the Holy Spirit looks at people and sees, sees destiny in you. He sees, he's speaking life to you. He doesn't see, he doesn't, he, he doesn't see the dirt, he sees the gold. And he's, and he's, and he's shifting through, he's getting right to the gold, says, ooh, look at this wonderful, you know, gem that's inside of you. You are such a blessing. You have a gift of service or, you know, and God's going to use that, and blah, blah, blah. And so those are, those are beautiful things, right? So I'm just talking, I gave you the 1% because it's fun to talk about the, the worst case scenarios. Okay, it's drama. But, uh, but that's not, those are worst case scenarios. Amen? Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's, uh, let's, if you pray in the Spirit, which is praying in tongues, pray to yourself in the Lord right now. There's an intercession thing that's going on. God's doing something in the Spirit. Just go ahead and pray in the Spirit. Now, if I'm praying to myself and God, will my neighbor hear me? Probably. Does it need interpretation? No, I'm praying to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Ola Maria, she came be te te te. She went to a gamba vatan basha chen be te te te. Se lea, she got a vantualia. Just keep praying, keep praying for. Olea, so I got a vantualia, she gay she she. Olea, she got a she she. Shady. I just saw a vice on somebody's head. It was a vice. And, and the enemy just kept squeezing it tighter and tighter and tighter. And, uh, and I feel like as we were praying that the Lord was trying to take this vice off of this person. Under, what was that? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for vice is gone off of minds. Confusion go. Pain go off of uh, migraine headaches going in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for confusion and deception and lies to go now in the name of Jesus. That people will hear completely what the Spirit of God says, what the Word of God says, and not twisted lies of the enemy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, now we can go. Come on. So, uh, look at Colossians 3.15. So when Paul had that dream, he submitted that dream to the group again, and they concluded together that it was God, and they moved forward. So isn't that cool? It's so cool. So here in that little passage of Scripture in Acts 16, you see an example of being led by the Spirit of God, being led by God, and also having dreams and being led by a dream. And, but, but, but it wasn't arbitrary. It was just submitted. Now, if you feel like God wants you to do something, like move to Mexico, you know, and 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 you t and you tell very close spiritual advisors, very st and several of them, they all say, I, I, I just see disaster. I don't, I don't think this is a good thing, man. We need to pray. You need to pray longer about this. Do you think you should still do it? Probably not. If, if you're the only one that feels like you're supposed to go to Mexico to, to, to be a missionary, and everyone around you, even the unbelievers are calling you crazy, and there's a chance you could be here. I mean, no one can tell you that you're not hearing from God. That's between you and the Lord. But we sometimes use each other. Okay, come on. You know, the, the Lord can sometimes uses each other as a check and a balance. Okay, so Colossians. Philippians, Colossians. General Electric Power Company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians 3.15. It was General Electric Power Company. Galatians... Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So that's uh, 3.15.
And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. So, the peace of God is the umpire of your heart. The peace of God is the umpire of your heart. Okay, let me give you a couple examples. Sometimes people can feel compelled and they make decisions, big decisions out of panic and fear. And then they get themselves into trouble. They go from the frying pan into the fire. Because they didn't wait on God. They just felt so much pressure and they felt so compelled to do something. And, and everybody was pressuring them and, the, and they just felt the pressure and, and, and all the finances. and Oh my gosh, what's going to happen? We're going to die. And then they just make this decision without seeking the Lord. This happened in the Bible. Saul was waiting for Samuel to come make the sacrifice. And some of his men were deserting because the army that they were facing was so fierce. And he didn't want to wait for Samuel, so he felt compelled because of the people to make the sacrifice, and it cost him, big time, cost him his kingdom, eventually. The more responsibility that you have, the more people that are affected by your decisions, the bigger the consequences that can be if you're not hearing from God. Yeah, so it's important that, uh, <laughs> that we learn how to hear the witness of the Spirit. So, fear and compulsion is not a good... Making big decisions when you're high or low is not a good way to do just big decisions. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When you're spiritually low and depressed or when you're, you know, you know, just aggressively on a high, you need to just wait, just settle down. And wait for the peace of God. Seek the peace of God. Discern. You have to learn to discern your own heart. Now, there are times where I'm in a very distressful situation and I want out of the situation. But the peace of God is still there to stay there. I remember, I remember a job I wanted to get out of so bad. I hated this job so much. Although I had to... I had every day, thank you for this job, Lord. Thank you for this job. But I, I just couldn't stand it. And, and there was opportunities for me to get out of this job. But the Holy Spirit would not let me quit. And people thought I was nuts. Why would God make you do this? And I said, I said it's the Lord. And then people would get saved. You know, as a result. And people would go to church as a result of this thing. And then I'd say, can I go now? No, you have to stay there. Oh, Lord, really, why? And, and I did. I submitted to the Lord. When one day a pastor came up to me, and he said, he said you know, I've, I've been watching your life, and I've seen how, how you've, you've just, you're not flaky. You just stayed with it. Stayed with it. And, and if I had... If my church had people like you in it, I mean, we'd really do something. Most people are just, they go totally by what they feel. Totally by what they feel. Not, they, they, character is not an issue. It's whatever they want to do. And, you know, the Holy Spirit's into the character building business. And we have to discern the peace of God. The peace of God is not whatever makes me happy. There's, there's deeper than that. It's, it's, I can have a peace running right into the fray. Because I know God is with me and that's what he wants me to do. Right? I can bear a huge burden because I have the peace of God. And I know the grace of God is there for me to bear it. <laughs> Come on, church. Come on. Now, am I glad when things are really go fantastic? Well, yeah, then I have a joy on top of that peace. So let the peace of God rule. In your hearts, to which you were called, in one body, and be thankful. Woo! The, the safest place for you and I to be is in the will of God. Yes. Where God wants you to be. That's the safest place to be. If it's in a war-torn region, you're in the safest place that you could possibly be, because that's God's will for you. Yeah? Yeah, yeah sure. Okay. Praise the Lord. So, uh, let's look at this one, Psalm 32. I, I can tell you guys are really getting something out of this. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. Psalm 32, look at this, Psalm 32, 7 to 9. 
I like this. It says, The Lord, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Woo! Songs of deliverance. Man, you can hear the angels you know, singing those songs of deliverance all around you. Praise the Lord. It says, Let's look at this, verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. Instruct you. Teach you. Train you. Yeah. I will guide you with my eye. Yeah, my mother used to guide me with her eye. <laughs> you get the mom eye. <laughs> no words were spoken there, but yet I knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got guided by the eye. Yeah. Okay, so... It says, do not be like the horse or like the mule, which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else they will not come near you. It's interesting that it used the horse and the mule. Because the horse has a tendency to run ahead, and the mule has a tendency to stubbornly uh, uh, lag behind. I didn't want to do a hee-haw thing. It just didn't feel right for the moment. So you don't want to be ahead of God or behind God. You can be right on time. He will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. And God has timing for things. You know, you don't want to do things that are out of his timing. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Some people are ready to get married at 18. Some people aren't ready till they're 30. Some people aren't ready till they're 40. We all have a different time. We, we're all on different timings. Yeah? He holds our times in his hands, the Bible says. In Psalm 1, it says, You'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water, and you'll bear fruit in your season. So we have a season of fruit bearing. And we comp always are comparing ourselves with other people's timing. And God has a different plan for you than he does other people. Your season of fruit bearing might not be the other person's se season of fruit bearing. You might be, you know, I, I was looking at those flowers that just bloomed in our yard. What, what kind of flowers are those, honey? Those daffodils? Everybody knows them because they drive by the house and they go, ooh, look at those daffodils. But they're so beautiful. But they, they're so short-lived. They're the, they're the earliest flowers that bloom, but they're only there for a week or two, and then they're gone. I'm so disappointed when they're gone. I'm like, couldn't you just last a little longer? You know? And we look at the daffodil, and we go, oh, look, at they're blooming ahead of us. Yeah? But, uh, you know, God has a perfect timing for different things. I just want you to know that I didn't, I didn't uh, senior pastor my first church till I was 41 years old. And I felt the call of God when I was 21. Yeah. And I did all kinds of ministry, all kinds of different things. Youth pastoring, music minister, traveling music ministry, blah, 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 outreach director. Everything you could possibly imagine. But I, I remember the one day I was on a program. It was, a, it, was a, um, it was called Ask the Youth Pastor. And so they had a panel of youth pastors and these questions would come in. And they would ask the youth pastors the questions. And, uh, and, you know, I was like flabbergasted that these pastors didn't know the word as good as, as, good as they should have. But uh, because but every question you had to have a Bible verse. You couldn't just, an you had to have a Bible verse to back up your answer for the question. Which you're just sitting there, you don't know what questions are coming at you. You know, so apparently I did really well on the, on the show. They wanted me to come back. But um, my dad was watching the show. And you got to understand, my dad wanted me to be a corporate executive. He wanted me to be, you know, a, a big GM executive. And, uh, and I rejected that call and went into ministry. And he, he wasn't really, you know, he tried to support me as best he could, but he, he wasn't really his, he was thinking, why don't you go make a lot of money? Why are you doing this for? But so he so he saw me on this program 
And when I saw him next time, he goes, I saw you on that program. I want you to know, son, you were head and shoulders above those other people on that program. He says, you, you need to be pastor in your own church. How many know the Father's blessing is a huge deal? When you get the Father's blessing? Come on. Come on. You don't realize how much a Father's blessing is. I mean, it's, it's a huge deal. So, so it was God's timing. It was God's timing. And then I went to a, Claudio, I went to a conference, Claudio Friedzon, who was a Argentina revival leader back in the 90s, 80s and 90s, a huge revival in Argentina. And I, and I went there, and he was preaching, and they had an altar call, and I was up at the altar call, and he grabbed me by the head, and he goes, It's your time! It's your time! It's your... But I can't do the accent very well, but it's... it's your, this Hispanic accent. And, and I was like, gee, I, I think I need a two by four to hit me alongside the head. <laughs> and then I went to, now some, some of you are smarter than me. You, you get it. You get it a lot faster than I got it. So, so I was at a conference and, and, and the, the guy was teaching. It was Dave Williams teaching. Dave, if you're watching, sorry about this, but it's a good story. But it was a, it was a good teaching. And he was preaching on 99 reasons why pastors fail. I can't, that's not, that was his, and he was number 89. You know, he's just going through this list, number 27. You know, and, and he was going through this list trying to train pastors on some things. And I'm sitting there, and one of the things he said was, Right now, there's 23 churches in the Michigan district that don't have pastors. Some of you guys need to step up. It's your time. Pastor at church. I kid you. That's what he said. And, and, and I went, and after that, I, I didn't hear anything else. I was like, number 82, blah, 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 blah. And he was just talking, and I, the Holy Spirit was dealing with me going, I prepared you. You need to take responsibility. You need to take one of those churches. That, uh, you need to take responsibility in the body of Christ. And I was like... I don't know, Lord. I don't know. I don't feel good enough. I don't feel like I can do it. And this Bengal tiger came out of Dave Williams, in the spiritual being, came out of him and ran around the side of the sanctuary. And it was coming right at me. And I was like, oh, Lordy. And this thing came up, went right inside of me. He goes, there, take it. That's the anointing to pastor. Now you don't have any more excuses. <laughs> And, and I went and did it, but I, t I just want you to know that, um, uh, um, <laughs> praise the Lord, it's so good. It's like Moses. Moses was on the backside of the desert. He's 80 years old. How many know you could use your age as an excuse, too? <laughs> too young or too old. You could use your age as an excuse. But God wouldn't have it. Moses ran out of excuses, and finally God got angry with Moses. Because this was not, it wasn't me trying to pump you up through your insecurities anymore. This was outright disobedience. <laughs> I mean, he'll listen to our excuses and he'll go, no, man, you can do it. No, you can do all things through me. No, you can do it. But then when it comes to we were so stubborn that we're disobedient, do it. Do it now. Yeah. Okay. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Wow. Praise the Lord. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. So, how do I wrap this up? I just want you to know that God, ha you're His friend. If you're if you're a Christian, you're not just you're not just a servant anymore. You're you're His friend. Look at this in John chapter 15 because this is really important. There is a servant aspect to being a Christian. There's, there's, there's a sonship aspect of being a Christian. But you're also a friend of God. Now if you, if you go to John chapter 15... Oh man, it's so good. Verse 15, 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends for all things that I've heard from my father. I've made known to you. 
So I just want you to know that God reveals secrets to his friends that other people are not privy to. When he came to, to, to Abraham, he said, Abraham, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do because you're my friend and I have a covenant with you. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham, thinking of Lot, going, Uh, Lot's there. <laughs> yep, I have to destroy it. The cry has come up before me. I'm showing you what I'm going to do ahead of time. Now, why did he want Abraham to know? So Abraham could intercede and, and, and partner with God about, what, about Lot and talk to him about that. Oh man, so good. You are God's friend. He's going to talk to you about people. He's going to go, he's going to go, you know, so-and-so is carrying a burden now. I want you to pray for him right now. I want you to partner with me and, and believe God. Hey, so, so can you text so-and-so right now? Could you give him a good word? You know, let me show you what I'm doing. Let me show you the direction that I'm going in the body of Christ. Partner with me. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! And I, those other verses you can look up at your, uh, at your Bible study about the secrets that God reveals. But I want you to look at one in particular, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Because we've got to bring this thing into a landing. Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may know and do all the words of this law. So, there are things that are above our pay grade you know, that we're not privy to the top secret information that's going on in heaven. That's why you pray in tongues. That's why you pray in the Spirit, because you're praying God's perfect will, according to Romans chapter 8. Because we don't know everything that we need to know. You know, and, and, and you know what? Sometimes it's none of our business. But if we're laying down our life sacrificially, the most sacrificial thing you can do is pray for somebody, intercede for them, and then pray in the Spirit for them, and let God have their will with that, that person. Yeah. Right? And not knowing the business. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Praise the Lord. But in, in Deuteronomy 29, 20, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So there's revelation. Now, now everything in the Bible is yours. We just made that confession, right? It's a, I, can, I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. But you have to know it. It has to be revealed to you personally. It's yours whether it's revealed to you or not. But when, it's re, when you get the revelation that it's yours, nobody will ever take that away from you. It's yours. And it's yours forever. Yeah. When you get the revelation that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You know. <laughs> that one God, you're his righteousness. Sure, there's things we need to repent of. We need to clean our hearts and everything. But the only way I can make it to heaven is because I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because of his sacrifice, I am sanctified positionally. There's a sanctification process that's going on in our lives. But I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You can approach the throne of God. And you go, well, well, do I need to beat myself in the back with a whip before I approach? Do I need to crawl up stairs with glass to approach the throne of God? You know, he already did that for you. You can approach because you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When you're in Him. If you're not in Him, then, well, you don't have the same access. Covenant people, non-covenant people. God is making a distinction, and I can tell you that He's going to start making a bigger distinction. As God's covenant people, as He pours out His Spirit in all flesh, people will see a distinction, a difference between the covenant people 
and the non-covenant people. Yeah. yeah. My kids were uh, in a, raised in a Christian school for, for a season, but then we moved uh, up north to pastor our first church, and then they were homeschooled for a season. And then my wife, uh, she got pregnant, and, and we couldn't, it was too difficult to be able to homeschool the kids at that particular time. So we're like, oh, we're going to have to put them in the public school for a season. I mean, and got, now, this was a big decision for us. Because, uh, um, you know, put, putting them in the public school, I mean, do we really want those influences on our kids' life? And every, I just want you to know, as a parent, you are the anointed one to make those decisions for your kids. If God tells you to, to homeschool them, homeschool them. If God tells you to put them in the public school, you put them in the public school. If God tells you to put them in a Christian school, you put them in a Christian school. You're the, you're the steward. You're the one that God's ultimately going to hold accountable and responsible for that. Yeah. Right? No one's going to tell you. So when, when the kids were homeschooled, peop, the kids in the church, the families in the church that were public schooled were like, are we some sort of a second class citizen because our kids are in the public school and your kids are homeschooled? But then when we put our kids in the public school, then all the homeschoolers were like, why are you rejecting us and making us feel like we're <laughs> wrong to do that? Come on, come on. It's your decision. Yeah, right? right? So, so anyways, so the Lord had to speak to my wife. My wife was, she was more concerned than I was. And, and she had uh, six, John 6, 17, where it said, keep them from the evil one. They're in the world, Lord, but keep them from the evil one. And God revealed that to her from the Bible. Gave her a witness and spoke to her that this was, at, for this season of their life, that this was God's will for them. Okay, everybody with me? Now, granted, my kids, church kids, always exposed, you know, raised up in a greenhouse of just church people and all around them their whole life. Now, all of a sudden, they're thrown into the public school. At first, you're, you're like, oh, my God, what's going to happen? The best thing that the world could ever have known happened, happened. They saw the evil and the wickedness and they saw the lack of morals, and they saw the brokenheartedness and the disasters of the lives of kids raised outside of God, and it strengthened their faith. It, they didn't get pulled into it. They went, yuck, wow. And they were praying for people. They were trying to help you. They bring, my girls were the, the biggest evangelists of the church. They were constantly bringing people to the school from the church, or to this church, and from workplace and stuff. And, uh, uh, God is making a distinction between the covenant people and the non-covenant people. There's no, I, I wonder if they, I wonder if they're saved. I wonder if they're not saved. I wonder if they're, no, no. Our faces are radiant with the presence of the Lord. God's pouring out his spirit on all flesh. Okay. So there's a secret thing. Praise the Lord. As it becomes harder to, become, to, to be a church and be with other Christians and go to church, I just I posted an article about a church in Canada that the police surrounded and wouldn't let anybody come into the church because the pastor had broken the COVID rules. This is a, a more socialist nation than we are, Canada, and they have different rules. They actually, to preach that certain, about certain sins from the Bible in Canada, is breaking a hate, it's called a hate crime, and you can be removed from your church. This is right north of us. So, so I just want you to know that as it becomes a little bit, you have to be a little bit more militant these days to be a Christian. You have to, you can, you have to be serious. It's, 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 no, it's no longer, do I want to sleep in or do I want to go to church? No, do I want to serve God or serve the devil? <laughs> <laughs> do I want to, do I want to risk my life and go into church, maybe a fine and jail time, and be with God's people, or do I want to stay home and sleep in? Right. It starts to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yep. No, no, this is this is starting now. And uh, uh, so so you ha you're going to see a distinction. God's covenant people, God's non-covenant people. When they tell you you can't buy or sell unless you have a mark or a vaccine, right. Right. when they tell you to do that, 
Guess what? It starts to separate the men from the boys, the women from the girls. Who's going to believe in the supernatural provision of God now? I just want you to know, Psalm 91 is still relevant. Amen. His abundant provision is still there. Amen. No matter what the environment. Preach. Yep. Preach. Well, I can't get this big job unless I do this and submit to this. Obey God. Right. Listen to the divine warning. <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. Let's pray. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're so good. You're so good, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And uh, we are, want you to make it, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you have to be willing to turn from what you know is wrong and serve him. And he will change you. You will be born again and experience a covenant relationship with God Almighty. There's nothing like it in the world. So if you're here today and you're not sure that you're going to heaven and you're ready to turn from what you know is wrong, just go ahead and, and wave your hand at me and let, let me see it. And I'll ask you to put that hand down. Is there anybody that wants to make Jesus their Lord and Savior today? Praise the Lord. We are going to uh, say this prayer for the sake of the live streaming. Because there's people live streaming right now that are not sure. They don't have a witness that they're children of God. And they need that witness so bad. They're crying out for it. So let's say this prayer together for the sake of those live streaming or on video. Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me. I, I need to turn from what I know is wrong. But I need your power. I need your help. I've made a mess of things. But you can get me out of it. You can give me the grace. You can help me. I believe Jesus died for me. So I could be forgiven. I believe he rose from the dead. So that I could have eternal life. I ask you to come into my heart. Come into my life and make me born again. Amen. Amen. So good, isn't it? Let's give the Lord a clap offering. Yeah. Now, these, these are really good. They're going to go over some of the stuff tonight at the, at the home groups. But my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Isn't that a beautiful scripture? My sheep know my voice. I hear them. I follow me. Now, the first king one at the bottom. Where it says, uh, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the pass by it, a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. Many people, when they're waiting to hear from God, are expecting... The wind to tear into the sides of the wall. They're expecting this big earthquake, this big sign, you know, from God. I just want to tell you, you're a New Testament Christian. God does, does do signs and stuff, but he'll, the main way that he's always going to speak to you is through the word of God and through the, the witness of your heart. That will always line up with the word of God. And uh, uh, even if there's some big sign or something like that, it still has to... If some prophet comes to you and tells you blah, 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 you are still responsible to look at the witness in your heart. You know, at the witness in your heart and the word of God. Right? Everybody with me? Okay, thank you, Lord. Let's stand up as we close today. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just ask that you bless your church, bless your people in the name of Jesus. I pray that your face just shines down and gives our people peace in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you'd build them up. Build them up and don't tear them down, Lord. Build them up. And only those things that are hindering them from the greatest blessings of their life, that you take the axe to the root of those things, Father, and tear it down, Lord, so that they can be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. These altars are open. If you need some prayer, come on forward. Love you.